everybody, and welcome to another edition of Nonprofit Executive Spotlight, brought to you by Rogue Tulips Nonprofit Consulting and Association Management Services. It's Friday, March 5th, and this week we're really excited to have with us Linda Devonish Mills, who's an expert in diversity and inclusion programs. So welcome, Linda. Thanks, Cecilia. It's uh, great for me to be here with you this morning. Well, I'm so glad that you can join us because this is a very timely topic. I think we all know this. We've been working on diversity and inclusion, I think, probably for a good 10 years in the nonprofit community, but recent events of the last two years have really brought this to light for us. So to kick off the conversation on diversity and inclusion, since that's your expertise, what do you think is the most important thing in launching a new diversity and inclusion program? Yes, so basically the the very first step, just like any other initiative, is that you have to probably come up with a brief, concise business plan, which although in this day and age, you know, you, it probably should not be a hard sell in terms of why an organization should move forward with diversity and inclusion uh, program or initiatives. But uh, just like anything else, you have to start with tone from the top and you have to uh, approach either your uh, senior leadership team uh, in addition to you know, uh, probably your board of directors to get buy-in from that group. So this way you can make sure that um, you, know, you have their support and they can provide the resources for you to move forward with an initiative that would be efficient and work effectively for the organization. Well, I'm a person who strongly supports diversity and inclusion and works to support that. And to me, it's relationship based. But when you're talking to a board of directors, they're looking at the business side of it, of course. And so what are some uh, good arguments, strong points to make regarding that business plan and how diversity and inclusion improves the bottom line? Right. So uh, you said the key word, Cecilia, the, you know, what affects the bottom line? So mostly when you're dealing with uh, a group of board of directors that have uh, an extensive financial background, that's what they want to hear. You know, how does it impact the bottom line? So there are many extensive reports out there, and I like to refer to uh, the reports that the McKinsey Group has uh, issued with diversity and inclusion. They have consistently stated in their reports that it's the organizations that have taken the time to uh, look at their uh, talent acquisition practices, for example, uh, in terms of making sure that they are recruiting a diverse talent pool of potential uh, you know, leadership executives and uh, also the, the, you know, the development of diverse teams. So this way, they can have uh, also an embracement of diversity of thought. That concept is important when you're building up uh, diversity and inclusion. And also uh, just any initiative that uh, develops or results in an inclusive environment is key to an, an organization's success. So all of those organizations that has taken the time to build up those type of initiatives clearly has shown much stronger financial results and also um, not even just in terms of the bottom line, but just the quality of the products and services that you know, they are offering to their clients. And also that also um, has an impact on relationship building as well, you know, because uh, more than ever, what uh, stakeholders are looking for, even when they invest in organizations, they want to see you know, what the, an organization is doing as it relates to diversity and inclusion. You know, uh, and again, starting with this board of directors, you know, um, a lot of companies now are under a mandate that they have to have a diverse composition of their board of directors even before someone would even consider investing in an organization. So it actually uh, relates a lot to, you know, buy-in uh, with uh, among their external and internal stakeholders as to why it is important to develop diversity and inclusion initiatives. I love all those points you just made, and I wish I could address every single one of them, but I'm just going to come back to the one about diversity of thought, because I think a lot of times people who aren't familiar with diversity and inclusion look at certain things like demographics. So like your age, right. your gender, and, you know, and let's just be honest, you know, skin color, we look at that. Yep. 
And, and a lot of people think that's that's diversity. And it's really not diversity because mm -hmm. despite the fact people might look alike, that doesn't mean they've had the same experiences and the same background. So what are some other things besides diversity of thought that you might be looking at when you're building a diverse team? So is it diversity of education? Is it diversity of regional background? I mean, what are some other things that contribute to diversity? Well, Cecilia, I'm glad you, you know, made a very good point because a lot of organizations do make the mistake thinking that, like, for example, if they fill quotas of, and I'll use my ethnicity for an example, you know, uh, they may think if they have um, a certain amount of African Americans on their staff, then they have filled, um, you know, their quota with diversity and inclusion. And as you said, that's not it at all. So, you know, organizations have to be very careful with that. Uh, so the, some of the examples that you did bring to the table is what, um, you know, organizations should be looking at. I can give a prime example of um, actually not so much with the nonprofit organizations, but even when I think about how I started my career in public accounting, mm -hmm. you know, uh, years ago, you could not be considered in a, a public accounting firm, especially one of the big four firms, unless you was going into um, the, the audit practice or the tax practice. It was just like cut and dry, you know. Mm -hmm. But now uh, the big four firms have evolved so much that, um, you know, there are a lot of people on their staff that doesn't even have accounting backgrounds. What they're looking for more so is that they, if they see some type of talent within an individual that allows them to provide analytical skills, mm -hmm. you know, or just um, business analysis, in, you know, in ways that a typical auditor or tax professional wouldn't look at in terms of a, a potential business perspective. Mm -hmm. Those are the type of people that attract, you know, those big four firms now uh, more so than what they were looking for 20 to 30 years ago. So that's a prime example of what all organizations, even definitely nonprofit organizations, need to look at. Where you know you may have that core competency for you know specific roles, but don't uh, rule out someone that can bring other aspects to the table that would just broaden the organization's horizons in terms of the type of services that they can provide. That's such a great example because bringing in, of course you need at an accounting firm accountants, but you also need other kinds of skills to better serve your clients. And that right. kind of comes back to team building, right? Yes. Because if you go out and you look for the people who bring what you need, you're probably gonna end up building a diverse team. Anyway. Exactly, yes. So I love that example, Linda. And Let's talk, we're, we're, we still have a little time left in our episode this week. So let's talk a little bit more about you specifically. So what kind of an organization are you looking for for your next opportunity? That's a great question, Cecilia. And I'm, I'm sorry that we only have a few minutes left because I can talk about this topic for hours. But <laughs> uh, to uh, take advantage of my time to describe myself, what I'm looking for is um, First of all, any organization that uh, I could see where it would be a mutual benefit uh, between the organization and myself in terms of what I can bring to the table. And I would just love the opportunity uh, to help an organization get you know, them started with a, a diversity and inclusion initiative where even though I may not have been in this space for a long time, my entire experience has been with building up diversity and inclusion initiatives. And it's very exciting to me. It, it you know, ties into my personal and per professional uh, passions uh, with diversity and inclusion. So I'm looking for an organization that just gets it in terms of how important it is, you know, uh, to build up such an initiative and the fact that they're going to make not short-term commitments and not even long-term commitments. I would just say more so that it's an ongoing uh, concept that never can be, um, you know, uh, diminished, so to speak, because uh, I think that's what a lot of organizations make the mistake that think that they could focus on it for two to three years and then they're done. Right. So um, that is not the type of organization that I want to join. So it is an organization that really gets it that diversity and inclusion is here to stay and it's ongoing and I am the person to help them get their feet off the ground. 
That's wonderful. That's a great summary. I know that's like one of those broad interview questions of like, well, what are you looking for? And but you right. answered that so well and so succinctly. So thank you for sharing that. So let's say I'm a chief staff executive and I hire you to start mm -hmm. a diversity and inclusion program at my organization because I know it's important, but I don't know how to do it. What's the first yep. thing you would do? The first thing that I would do is that I would have to do my homework in terms of, you know, who are your stakeholders? Um, what is your mission and vision in general? Um, what, what type of services that you're trying to provide? And um, I would uh, develop some type of business case to your senior leadership team and your board of directors uh, to explain to them why it is important you know, for us to move forward with this initiative, pretty much what I've already described in this, you know, interview. And then in terms of the first tactical step, if it's not already in place, we would actually have to uh, work on uh, the organization's uh, visibility. Mm -hmm. You know, how are they presenting themselves as an organization that takes diversity and inclusion seriously? So um, the first step with that is to come up with a, either um, like some organizations call it a diversity and inclusion statement, mm -hmm. or I like to call it a commitment because even referring it to a statement is too static of a reference, you know, whereas commitment, you know, you're, you're stating yourself or representing the organization as something, uh, an organization that gets it, that it should be ongoing. So based on the culture, of the organization, we would start with a commitment. And then once we, uh, cause that would be like the blueprint in terms of how the organization should move forward. And then the next step would be probably most organizations, what they have is some type of steering committee or advisory uh, council among the, it's usually like the senior leaders of each area of operation that uh, I would work closely with as my sounding board in terms of, you know, what the initiative would look like. Um, you know, I would have regular conversations in terms of what they're trying to achieve within their areas, uh, you know, from a diversity and inclusion perspective, um, where the most critical business partner for me would be like human resources, for example, oh. uh, working with that group in terms of what type of training we should be providing to employees. Uh, and it should be a mix of both formal and informal training. Mm -hmm. And then also talent acquisition. And then even beyond that, again, going through each area of operations in terms of how we can uh, integrate diversity of thought as we are looking at how to build uh, products and services. You know, in a nutshell, that's in general what would be my role coming in uh, in terms of the initial steps that I would take. And then once all of those get into fruition, then we would have to start talking about metrics and key performing indicators. So this way we can come up with a reporting structure to inform our board of directors how the organization is progression in this area. And I think that is a great approach because you've integrated research, you've integrated pulling in other people, expanding the team, across the board, across the entire organization, and then figuring out, are we actually hitting some marks and, and right. making that commitment? And I love that you pointed that out. There's a difference between a static policy statement and an ongoing commitment to something, which is an action word. So right. well, we're about at the end of this week's episode and uh, okay. it's been a great conversation. And what is the best way? Let's, you know, when, so somebody's going to want to hire you. So what's the best way to yes. get in touch with you? Um, a couple of ways. Uh, I have, uh, I am on uh, LinkedIn under uh, Linda Devonish Mills. And uh, uh, definitely I can be reached um, through my email address, which is Mills at yahoo.com. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Linda. And I encourage all of you out there, if you want to talk to somebody about diversity and inclusion, please reach out to Linda. And especially if you're looking to fill that role or create that role in your own organization. So Linda, thank you again for joining us here on Nonprofit Executive Spotlight. And on behalf of Rogue Tulips Nonprofit Consulting, I'm Cecilia Sup, 
and you can learn more about Rogue Tulips at roguetulips.com. And don't forget to check out our other series, Chatting with Agnes and Cecilia Nonprofit Conversations, which you can find a link to on our website on the resources page. So we'll be back next time with another episode, unless everybody gets a job. Until then, we'll see you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>